Have you ever wondered why you are the way you are? Are you you because of your genes? Because of how you were raised? Or could it be both? Welcome back to Bogo Biology, and for this screencast, we're going to discuss the concept of epigenetics and how it helps us to understand the interactions of nature and nurture in development. Traditionally, we've said that acquired traits are not inherited, and this is true most of the time. For instance, this creature has yellow fur. It can choose to dye its fur neon pink, but it's still going to produce yellow offspring. However, as we learn more about genetics, we've come to realize that experiences actually can change gene expression. Factors such as diet, drug use, and chemical exposure can have a profound impact on our bodies. All three of these factors are capable of changing which genes are active and which genes are inactive. We used to believe that these changes in gene activation could not be passed on to offspring. However, we're recently discovering that these changes actually are heritable and can be passed on to children, grandchildren, and sometimes even great-grandchildren. Their genetic code itself has not been modified, but we have slightly changed which sections are active and which sections are inactive. These are heritable changes in gene expression that do not arise from changes to the DNA sequence itself. This is what we call epigenetics. Another way to think about this is that we've changed the organism's phenotype without changing its genotype. Understanding gene expression is crucial to understanding epigenetics, so here's a quick review. To begin with, every cell in the body contains the exact same DNA code. DNA acts like a blueprint for making every kind of protein that the body needs. The DNA is coiled up tightly inside the nucleus of the cell. A gene is a section of DNA that codes for a particular set of characteristics. Each cell type requires different traits, and thus they need to make different proteins. The cell uses one DNA code to make many proteins by utilizing different sections for different purposes. One cell type might use a certain section of the DNA molecule, and another type might use a different section. If a gene is in use and coding for proteins, we say that it is either turned on or expressed. So how exactly does epigenetics influence gene expression? There are actually a number of mechanisms, but the two about which we know the most are DNA methylation and histone modification. Remember that the interior of the DNA molecule is made up of four nitrogen bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, and that these are connected together by hydrogen bonds. Methyl groups, which look like this, can attach to the DNA molecule. These methyl groups can attach to some of the cytosine nitrogen bases. The methyl groups prevent RNA polymerase, a key enzyme in the manufacturing of proteins, from effectively grabbing onto the DNA molecule. Since this section of DNA can no longer be used to code for proteins, we now call it a silenced gene. The gene has effectively been turned off. DNA is normally wrapped very tightly around protein complexes known as histones. It unspools a little bit at a time in order to be accessed and used, kind of like an old-fashioned reel-to-reel -reel film. Adding methyl or acetyl groups to histones impacts the ease with which they unspool. As with DNA methylation, the addition of a methyl group will inhibit the manufacturing of proteins from a certain gene. This is because the methyl group attaches to the histone and causes the DNA to coil more tightly, making it more challenging for enzymes to gain access. Adding an acetyl group has the opposite effect. Acetyl groups are thought to loosen the wrapped DNA, making certain genes more accessible. The process of both methylation and acetylation of histones is actually reversible. The addition and removal of these groups is done by enzymes and can be repeated many times. Research has shown that exposure to toxic chemicals or a lousy diet can cause these acetyl and methyl groups to bind in the wrong place and either activate or silence the wrong genes. This is especially problematic if, for instance, the error caused a tumor suppressor gene to be silenced. Now let's talk about a few examples. We'll begin by discussing agouti mice. Certain mice have a mutation in a gene called the agouti gene. The mutation makes them obese and yellow, as well as being susceptible to heart disease and diabetes. We would expect these unhealthy mice to give birth to unhealthy offspring, but in 2003, Waterland and Gentle showed that it was possible to silence the agouti mutation. The female mice were fed a diet that was rich in methyl groups. The methyl groups seemed to silence the agouti gene, and the offspring were born healthy. Studies have also shown correlations between human maternal health and the health of the offspring. We encourage mothers to eat folic acid before and during their pregnancy because it helps with proper neural tube formation. Another famous experiment showed the effect of epigenetics on the stress response. Inside of the midbrain of a rat is a region known as the hippocampus. 
Within the hippocampus are structures known as glucocorticoid receptors, which help mediate the stress response. Receiving adequate care early in life seems to be a key factor. Baby rats who receive adequate care and grooming from their mothers in the first weeks of life appear to demethylate the genes for glucocorticoid receptor development. When we remove the methyl groups, it switches the genes on and allows for proper development of glucocorticoid receptors within the hippocampus. These rats generally grow up to become healthy and well-adjusted adults. If baby rats do not receive adequate care, however, they never develop the same level of glucocorticoid receptors. They also grew up to be highly anxious adults who had a very difficult time managing their stress response. There appears to be a strong relationship between maternal care and the development of a healthy stress response later in life. Researchers are looking into the possibility of a similar relationship in humans by studying victims of childhood trauma. Hopefully in years to come, we will continue to expand our knowledge of epigenetics how it impacts our lives, and the extent to which epigenetic changes might be reversible. All right, that's pretty much it for this week. If you found this video useful, I hope you'll consider subscribing to my channel and also checking out some of my other videos. I put a lot of time and effort into creating them, and I'm always looking for new content ideas, so please leave your thoughts in the comment field below. Thanks for watching, and as always, please don't forget to subscribe.